everyone, and thank you for attending this non-traditional ZMAX webinar. Today, we're going to be doing a product demo for you guys, and we're also going to be spending a lot of time on Q&A and just really focusing on your specific questions. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kristen Norton, and I'm the product manager for Optic Studio here at ZMAX. Before being the product manager, I was a senior optical engineer here, and prior to that, I was a laser and optics engineer in the hardware world. And my background is in physics and applied physics. I'm also here with uh, Dr. Thomas Pickering. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Pickering. I'm a product engineer here for Optic Studio. Previously worked as a senior optical engineer here at ZMAX, and before that, I was a research physicist working at CERN and Cornell, and I've got a background in particle and accelerator physics. Thank you, Tom. So now we'll get started uh, with the demo. All right, so the plan for today is to start with just an introduction to Optic Studio, and I'll walk you through some key areas of the user interface. And then we'll talk about the three different simulation modes. Uh, these are really important to understand for new users because this will help you choose which mode you're going to be working in and making that decision early on will make your lives a whole lot easier. Then, like I said, we'll spend hopefully the bulk of this time answering your questions. Uh, we do have some questions that were submitted before the webinar. Uh, so once I go through the introduction, I'll launch right into those questions. And then after that, we'll take any other questions that you have submitted. Okay, so let's get started. There are a few key areas of the Optic Studio interface that I'd like to cover. And a big part of the reason why I'm covering these now is so that if you have the trial version installed, you'll feel comfortable uh, navigating the different areas and you'll understand how it all works. Uh, so we'll start with these the key areas of the user interface. Uh, then we'll talk about how you can arrange different windows. Then we'll talk about uh, two different types of windows. There are editors and analysis windows. And then this is probably the most important for you all. Uh, we'll show you where the help files are and how to open them. Uh, the trial version also comes with a lot of sample files. So we'll show you how to open those as well as where you can find some more resources. Okay, so this is a screenshot of the Optic Studio user interface and we've got these big numbers calling out some different areas of the user interface. So here, number one is the ribbon bar. This should look pretty familiar. It's modeled similarly to other Windows applications, but you have a file tab where you'd go if you wanted to open files, save files, or convert file formats. The setup tab, here this is really to set up the user interface or other specific things for your project. Then we have an analyze tab, optimize tab, and tolerance tab. These are three of the major capabilities of our software, uh, which come in all editions of the software from standard to premium. Uh, then we have a libraries tab, and this is where you'll find a lot of the uh, stock catalog data or third party vendor data. We also have part designer, which is um, a built in CAD program that's available in the premium edition of Optic Studio. And we have a programming tab pretty self-explanatory, and then the help tab, which we'll get to a little later on. Uh, then over here on the left side is a system explorer, and you'll see there's a little pin here. So this can be hidden or expanded. It uh, just depends on how you want to adjust your workspace. But these settings are kind of like project-specific settings or system-specific settings that you really only set once in the beginning. So for example, this is where you'll define the wavelengths that you want to trace or the temperature and pressure for defining the environment that your optics are in. Okay, let's see, number three here, this is gonna be the bulk of your user interface or what we call the main workspace. And in just a moment, I'll show you how we can arrange windows here. But both the System Explorer and the ribbon bar can be minimized uh, to maximize uh, this main workspace area. Okay, then the last two areas are much smaller. We have the quick access toolbar up on the top here. And the quick access toolbar can be customized. Uh, so you can add um, any of the buttons that you see in the main ribbon bar up to the quick access toolbar, uh, just to make it easy to access some of the features that you use most frequently. 
then down at the bottom we have what we call the, the status bar. It's the blue strip here. Uh, and this is also customizable. And you can choose which calculations are reported here. So for example, this is the effective focal length. Then we have the working F number, the entrance pupil diameter, um, and the total track length. This slide is just showing some different examples of how you can arrange your workspace. So here, uh, with the blue outline, we have an example showing um, multiple analysis windows in an editor uh, docked to the workspace. Uh, docked means there's this tab up on top, and it's sort of like it's snapped to a specific section of the workspace. Um, and you can break this up in a variety of different ways, and, and we'll show you how to do that in just a moment. But then the box with the green outline shows another option which is docking all of the windows to a single workspace. This essentially maximizes all of the windows as well. And then we have a third option here with a red outline that's what we call floating windows and the floating windows are not docked to a specific section of the workspace and they can overlap each other um, and you can arrange them very easily there. Uh, you can also have a combination of docked and floating windows, uh, which we'll show you in just a moment as well. All right, so this next slide shows the symbol that pops up when you start dragging the windows around. So this RMS versus field is an analysis window that's floating, and then we have three different docked windows behind it. And as I left click on this title bar and drag the analysis around, when I hover over these three different sections of the workspace, I'll see this icon pop up in the middle of them. And this is how you can choose whether you want to split up this workspace further and potentially dock this RMS versus field, for example, in the right half of this window, or I could hold it over the middle icon here and then dock it behind this existing window utilizing the same amount of space. And Tom and I will have Optic Studio open um, when we get to your question, so you'll see us navigating the user interface in just a moment. So we have mainly two different types of windows, although there are a few exceptions, but this is a screenshot of the Lens Data Editor, and this is how you enter information into your system. Uh, in sequential mode, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but in sequential mode, your lenses and objects are defined surface by surface, and each row here represents a new surface definition. So there are three key areas of the editor. One, you have a toolbar up on top, and these contain icons that allow you to add in fold mirrors or uh, reverse uh, the order of the surfaces here. But they're primarily actions that you can take to adjust the properties of your system. Okay. Then we have this section here which we call the properties dialog and using this arrow here up in the uh, title bar of the properties dialog you can expand or collapse the properties. But this properties dialog is specific to each of the surfaces in your editor. So you have some parameters which are exposed down here in the spreadsheet region and these have parameters that you can optimize and very quickly change. But the properties dialog contains additional settings that you typically aren't going to change after you've set it the first time. Okay, the next window I wanted to talk about is an analysis window. And there are a few different key sections of this window as well. Just like with the editors, there's a toolbar up on top. Um, and this has settings that allow you to copy or save the window, you can add annotations or clone it. We also have now a settings dialog similar to the properties here. Okay. And the settings dialog determines the calculation and display settings for the plotted and calculated data. Okay, then we have the main plot area here labeled three data analysis. And these plots are interactive, so you can drag the axes around and change the scales. Uh, you also can check the curves on and off in the legend uh, just to isolate a specific uh, curve. All of these windows also have unique right-click menus. 
And so the options will vary depending on which kind of analysis window you're in. But these, these uh, can also interact with some of the settings here in your settings dialog or other display settings uh, for the plotted data. You'll also notice that we have the tabs down here highlighted. The default view doesn't have this classic tab. It's just an old graphics view, so just ignore that for now. But your analysis windows will have a graph tab and a text tab. And the graph tab is what opens up by default, and this is where you see all of the plotted data. But if you wanted to view all of the numbers and the calculated data, uh, you just go over to the text tab, and then it'll show you in, in um, high detail all of the values that are being plotted. Okay, we just had a question come in. What does conic mean in the lens data editor? Let me go back. I believe the question was on this slide showing the screenshot of the lens data editor. And there's a column here labeled conic. Uh, that's a good question. And actually I should point out that these labels on, on top of the editor, um, the ones that are further to the right, the headings will change based on which surface you have selected. So the first, uh, the first chunk of columns here, these will be consistent for pretty much all of your surfaces. But as you start to add or change the surface type, which actually you can see here in the surface for properties, there's a drop down menu for standard. Right, so standard is the type of equation that's used to define the shape of the surface. And conic shown here is one of the parameters in that expression. And so let's say you had this question, go one more slide down. Anytime you have a question about something in the user interface, look for the closest question mark because this will open up the help files. So you can see we have two question marks highlighted here. There's one in the System Explorer and another one in the Lens Data Editor. Okay. If you click the one in the Lens Data Editor, it opens up the help files to the Lens Data Editor section. And uh, this section actually, um, if, if I were to click this expansion button here, would show me the list of all of the different surfaces that I could define. So actually, let me just skip ahead and go to Optic Studio. Here we go. So now you can see Optic Studio here. And so the question was about this conic column. If I click on this question mark, oops, sorry, I have multiple monitors. It opened on the wrong one. Here's the lens data editor. And you can see there's a, it says for a list of sequential surfaces, see sequential surfaces. You can also expand it here. Okay. And then you have a list of all the different kinds of parametric um, and actually non-parametric surfaces. So if we scroll down to standard, here you can see the equation um, that, that governs the shape of that surface. Okay. Um, and the conic constant is this little k uh, right here. And so there's a, there's a thorough description for uh, for all all surfaces, so you should be able to uh, know in great detail uh, what it is you're defining. Okay, I hope that answers the question, uh, but please let me know if, if you'd like more clarification. All right, so moving on. Um, so this slide shows where to find the sample files, right? So like I said, knowing how to open the help files is probably the first thing you want to figure out how to do so you can define everything you're, you're looking at. But then second, we have hundreds of sample files that come with the trial version. And uh, these are a really good place for you to start to understand some of the different uh, features and the different ways you can set up your, uh, your optical systems. Um, so in the file tab here, just click the open button and by default it'll open up to your samples folder. And then um, within the samples folder there are other subfolders which contain different kinds of systems. And so now this is a screenshot of the help tab and this shows just all of the different resources that we have built into the user interface. Number one, the help files. So you can also open up the help system through the help tab. Uh, we also have a very, very helpful guide called the uh, Getting Started Using Optic Studio Guide. It's this uh, button here with the box around it uh, for number two. Uh, this 
guide includes some tutorials uh, that will help you get started and will walk you through uh, designing systems in Optic Studio. Uh, so this is, is just really, really a good place for you to get started if you are unfamiliar with Optic Studio. Uh, we also have a free online knowledge base. Um, and so clicking this button in the UI will link you to that section of our website. And the knowledge base contains a lot of how-to articles. So the help system, by comparison, this is more of defining all of the different inputs and, and what you see in the user interface. Whereas if you wanted to know how to do something, that's when you would go to the knowledge base. Uh, once you've purchased Optic Studio, there's a handy button here to email technical support. And before purchasing though, just contact your sales representative and uh, they'll put you in touch with um, me or Tom or potentially one of the engineers to help you out. And we also have a ZMAX user forum, and our users are very active here. You can post questions or, um, or review other discussions and just hear what's happening um, in the, the ZMAX community. Okay, so uh, we'll be out of the slides soon, I promise. <laughs> but I, I do want to quickly talk about the three different simulation modes in Optic Studio. Uh, so first we have what we call non-sequential mode, and this is used for um, illumination, lighting, and, and stray light uh, system design. Then we have sequential mode, and this is for uh, more of what we call the classical optical design. And this is for designing imaging systems and afocal systems, or some of the systems shown here, like telescopes, microscopes, or camera lenses, anything where there's a primary path for the light to go. And then we have a very special mode uh, called physical optics propagation. And this is for a more sophisticated algorithm than ray tracing, uh, which is what uh, primarily what non-sequential and sequential mode use. Uh, but physical optics propagation propagates a coherent wave front. And so it can be used uh, for simulating more sophisticated uh, lasers or fiber systems. So um, let's talk about the relationship of these three different modes. Uh, the big blue circle in the background, or a dark blue one, represents non-sequential mode. So in theory, all systems could be uh, simulated in non-sequential mode. And, and by simulated, we mean all of the parts could be defined. But some of these systems have sequential paths, and that means there's a primary path that the light follows. And therefore, it will be modeled much, much faster in sequential mode. Um, and, and this is really significantly faster. If it's possible to start in sequential mode, you always should just because of the time savings. And then thirdly, there are some sequential systems that require physical optics propagation. And these are systems where rays do not adequately describe the way that the light is propagating. Right? So for example, these are you know systems with where you have a, a laser beam that, that has to propagate over a very, very long focal length. Or if you need to uh, show what happens as the beam goes through a pinhole and you need to simulate the diffraction effects after that, that that's a, a good use for physical optics propagation. So this table summarizes the three different modes and we don't have to go through all of this now, but you'll have these slides available for you afterward. This is a very good guide for determining which mode you need. So like I said, we have sequential mode that's intended for classical optics design. This mode is just lightning fast. It's very, very efficient because it makes key assumptions. And then we have non-sequential mode where the rays can take a much more general path, but of course that means you have to trace more of them. And then physical optics propagation. And really the key thing to look at in this table is this second row here. Think about what you're going to be measuring and optimizing, um, and then choose your mode based on that. So here's another screenshot just highlighting some of the differences between sequential mode and non-sequential mode. So this is the exact same system, but the image on top is simulated in sequential mode. So all of the rays start here on the left-hand side, and they propagate through and hit all of the surfaces in the exact same order. So here's where our object plane is, then everything hits surface one, then the back face of the first lens is surface two, next lens is surface three, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to the image plane here. In addition to restricting the light to all following the same path, we're making a few other assumptions, including we're not tracing all the potential angles and positions um, that rays could have from here the object plane. 
we're restricting it to here four different points. Okay. And, and the idea is that these four points are representative of all of the light that could be coming from um, this object plane. So in this case, we have a rotationally symmetric system, so we're only tracing four points up here um, along the vertical y-axis. Okay. And in addition to restricting where the rays are coming from, we're also only launching them to fill the smallest aperture um, in our system. Okay. So in reality, we'll have a source over here that's emitting rays in all different directions, and these rays will go much beyond these lenses. But we only care about the ones that make it through our system, which means they have to pass through the smallest aperture. Right? And that means that we can do a very detailed analysis of the rays that do make it through our system. We can identify aberrations, calculate the MTF, and perform a lot of other analyses very, very quickly. Then down at the bottom, you see the exact same system. So the lenses are exactly the same, but this is in non-sequential mode. And so our source is very different. Here we have a more realistic source right, where we are tracing rays in all different directions and from the full area of our source. Um, and then these rays um, don't have to follow the same path. They're splitting and, and scattering and, and reflecting and refracting. But you notice over here, looks like there's only one ray that actually makes it all the way down to the image plane. Okay, So the purpose of this picture here is to show that millions more rays would be required to perform the same analysis here um, for the system in non-sequential mode when compared to the same system in sequential mode. So just going back to this slide showing the three different relationships, I also wanted to add on um, some notes that show which additions have which modes. So Optic Studio started as ZMAX, and originally the only mode we had was sequential mode. And of course, you can understand that was due to the computational power available to us then. So now the standard edition of Optic Studio is, is sequential mode alone, but then both the professional and premium editions include all three modes. And for all three modes, we have um, both um, the analysis features, as well as optimization features, and I, I shouldn't have said both, we have, because <laughs> there's more than two, and also all of the tolerancing features. So even our standard edition includes analysis, optimization, and tolerancing features. Um, the limitation is that it's just two sequential systems. That's it for the slides. So go ahead and submit your questions using the uh, question section of the, uh, the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and while you're submitting these, I wanted to start with some of the questions that were submitted when you signed up for, uh, for this webinar. So let me switch to Optic Studio. There we go. And I'll go through some of the questions. Okay. So one of the questions was about um, the OPD uh, reference um, or the optical path difference reference. Um, so I'm not sure how familiar you are, all are with um, uh, wavefront plots and looking at the wavefront error of your optical system. Uh, but this is a, a really common analysis tool in sequential mode. So we have a whole set of tools that analyze the wavefront. And by analyzing the wavefront, we can pick out a lot of different aberrations and understand um, how to make our system uh, better, essentially. And so the um, the optical path difference, or OPD, um, is calculated um, by default against a reference um, of the exit pupil. And so the reason for this is that if, if you weren't subtracting out a reference, then these plots would be really difficult to pull out the meaningful information. So what we're doing is subtracting out a perfect wavefront and just looking at um, the resulting deviations from that. Uh, if we didn't subtract this out, then the bulk of the curves for all of these would be um, what, what it would be considered the perfect wavefront. All right, so um, we do have some advanced settings here in the System Explorer. Let's see, where's the advanced section here? That allow you to change this reference. Uh, so it's the exit pupil by default, but we also have an absolute infinity, and then an absolute two. Um, so the infinity reference here 
means that the exit pupil is really, really far away. Um, and actually, I should probably talk a little bit. I'll try to talk in high level about the exit pupil, um, just for those of you who aren't as familiar with um, um, optical system design. But um, in sequential mode, we, um, like I said, we're only tracing rays that will make it through the smallest aperture in our system. And we call this uh, smallest aperture the stop surface. So this is a pretty standard double gauss design. And here you can see um, surface six. Here is our stop surface. So the rays are being launched um, to fill the stop surface. Um, however, they actually aren't being launched to fill this surface because over here on the other side of the lenses, um, we see a slightly different diameter and position right? because these three lenses distort this. So the size and position of this small aperture as seen from um, before the, the optics is uh, what we call the entrance pupil. Right? So the rays are launched to fill the entrance pupil. Okay? And that's a very uh, key characteristic of sequential mode. Now, if we look from the other side, okay, the lenses after the stop will also distort where um, the stop appears to be and how big it appears to be. And that's what we call the exit pupil uh, size and location. So um, the, the reference sphere is calculated using the exit pupil size and position. All right, now going back to these different references here, infinity means that the exit pupil is really, really far away. Um, and in that case, um, we'd want to analyze the OPD just based on uh, the angular displacement from uh, the perfect reference sphere instead of um, a linear uh, displacement. Okay, So infinity essentially is kind of like an angular reference. Um, and then absolute and absolute two are a little bit different. Um, and these, these are good if, if Optic Studio is having a difficult time calculating the exit pupil. So for, um, for very complex systems or off-axis systems, um, you might need to use these. Um, but essentially, it's, it, for absolute and absolute two, it's not calculating the exit pupil, and it's not subtracting out that perfect reference sphere. Um, for absolute, it's, um, it's subtracting out a, a plane. So it's calculating, it's, it's subtracting essentially the, the chief ray, and it's a plane that is perpendicular to the chief ray, whereas absolute two isn't subtracting out any chief ray reference. Um, and let's say you weren't asking me this in the demo. You can click on the question. Oh, sorry, I opened up on my other monitor in the System Explorer open the question mark, and we can go down to the advanced section and look at the reference OPD. And you'll see all of these definitions um, here in the help files. OK. Let's see. Um, there was a question about the uh, Strel ratio calculation um, and fiber coupling in Optic Studio. Uh, so the, the Strel ratio. Um, is it's the, the peak intensity of the PSF um, um, divided by the peak intensity of an ideal PSF without um, any aberrations. Um, and we have a variety of analyses that will calculate this for you. Um, here, let me turn off, change my update settings just to make this a little faster. Um, so if you look in the Analyze tab here, this is where we have um, all of the analyses that, that evaluate the performance of your system. Um, and and so none of these um, these tools change your system at all. It's just analyzing the performance. And, and so one of the things you might want to look at is the Strel ratio. And all of the analyses in this RMS tab here, um, they analyze the RMS of something versus um, your field position. And so uh, let's see. One of the settings here, the data here, is a Strel ratio. Right? So we can look at um, how the Strel ratio changes with, uh, with increasing uh, field position. Okay, you can see in this case, this is not a diffraction limited system. Um, the Strel ratio is much less than one, and so it's, it's not very high. Um, uh, but in theory, if this, if this were a more diffraction limited system, then you would see a much higher Strel ratio um, across your field. 
let's see. There's another question about the fiber coupling capabilities in Optic Studio. And uh, we have a few different ways that you can calculate fiber coupling. If you look in the lasers and fibers section of the analysis tools, there's a fiber coupling drop down menu. And we have a tool for single mode fiber coupling and multi mode fiber coupling. Um, so, multi mode fiber coupling is, is a lot easier because you can um, use the geometric rays, but for single mode fiber coupling, you do need to look at the, um, the diffraction limited uh, spot size and, and see how that would couple into a single mode fiber. Um, and so that analysis does that. But then we also have um, a fiber coupling option in physical optics propagation. So this analysis is not set up correctly, so this is a, a meaningless result here. Um, but uh, if you're propagating a laser beam and you want to, and if there's a complex um, um, uh, profile, you can still calculate um, the uh, fiber coupling integral here, um, which can be can be very very helpful, especially for more complex beams. Let's see, I'm just going to keep going through the list of questions that you had submitted before. And then um, I see there are some other questions coming in. Um, so rest assured, we will get to those um, in just a minute. We're going to take them as, as they come in order. So uh, there was a question about um, the temperature dependence of systems. And um, let's see, in particular, it looks like this question is, is relating to LEDs and photodiodes. And, um, and incorporating uh, the temperature dependence. All right, so um, that's a good question. Um, and to some extent, we can account for that, but I don't think that it's going to be doing the full extent of what you want. Um, so we do have, uh, let me close this. In the System Explorer, let me pin this down, we have some environment settings here, and you can check this on. Um, and, and what this does is it will adjust the um, index data of all of your different uh, optics materials uh, based on the uh, temperature and pressure that you have entered in here. Um, taking this a step further, we also have a make thermal tool. And what this does is it will automatically calculate the changes in thickness um, and diameter index, all changes necessary um, to, to change your, your system um, to a steady state um, at a range of different temperatures. So for example, if I clicked um, OK on this window here, we'll be creating three different configurations um, at a temperature of 20 degrees, an intermediate temperature, and then at a temperature of 100 degrees. So if I click OK, let me close this. I now have, oops, here. I have um, a multi-configuration editor. This is similar to the lens data editor in that um, each of the rows um, contain different um, pieces of information about my system. But the cool thing about this multi-configuration capability is that you can define a whole new system uh, by changing just one parameter in your lens data editor. So the multi-configuration editor defines what's different um, in each of the different configurations. So here, configuration one is sort of my reference. Um, I started with 20 degrees. And then here are the three different temperature configurations that were generated after that. And then the pressure, curvature, thickness, um, glass information, semi-diameter, um, all of these other parameters were automatically calculated based on the change in temperature. So my point is that if you want to simulate your system in a steady state temperature and pressure environment and, and see what happens when you change those, um, uh, but again, in a, in a steady state, um, meaning we're not simulating the heat propagating through anything, um, then you absolutely can do that. Um, and that would be one reason uh, to purchase the uh, professional version over the standard version. Um, however, if you are trying to simulate how um, heat propagates through your system or um, different hot spots in your system and how, how that 
light is absorbed and then changes the optical properties. Um, that's, that's a little more complicated and it isn't something that we do uh, by default. Okay. Okay. I hope that answers your question. And if you do have more specific questions after this, you're welcome to email us. Okay, let's see, moving on to the next one. Uh, can your program calculate the propagation uh, characteristics of multi-transverse mode light uh, from a DFB laser? Uh, so, the physical optics propagation analysis um, can simulate uh, multi-mode and, and higher order uh, beams. So, this is a very, uh, very general description of the beam. Uh, really, the main limitation um, is that your um, your phase can't be changing too quickly. So if the if your beam is is diverging or converging uh, very very sharply, uh, then it, it's really difficult for this algorithm to um, to accurately calculate that that fast change in phase. Um, but if if it's not changing too quickly, then yes, this algorithm um, should be able to handle that. Uh, the trick is really defining your beam. So I've just opened up this. Um, section of the help files on physical optics propagation. Um, and there's a lot to read here, uh, but it is, it's fairly easy to read. And, and you really should tr go through this if, if you're planning on using physical optics propagation, because it's important to understand the algorithm that we're using and what assumptions that it makes. Let's see. OK, there's a question. Can your program model um, the characteristics of light as is it as it is coupled into and out of a single mode polarization maintaining fiber. All right, so Optic Studio is for free space propagation, um, meaning we can calculate how the light gets coupled into the fiber, and then you can use the output of that fiber and plug it back into Optic Studio to simulate propagation, you know, further downstream. But we are not simulating uh, what happens to the light as it propagates through uh, your fiber. Okay, and then the last question that came in before uh, this demo um, said, can you comment on the tolerancing of non-sequential designs for manufacturing purposes? Okay, very good question. So, uh, thus far, I've really only been opening up um, windows from this Analyze tab, but we also have uh, two other tabs that you'll be using a lot, um, which we call the Optimize tab and the Tolerance tab. So optimization is the process where you uh, make your system better. So uh, you have to define what it is to be better, and that's where the merit function editor comes into play. And we have um, a, a wizard which um, will automatically populate all the different calculations needed to measure uh, how good your system is. Okay. Um, so in this case, um, we would be optimizing the RMS wavefront error and trying to drive the wavefront error to zero. And Optic Studio will do this automatically based on the parameters in this editor here that you set to be variable. So for example, I could set all of my radii to be variable, meaning Optic Studio should change all of these values, um, attempting to make um, the value in my merit function better. Now, that process will get the best possible system, uh, but it doesn't tell you whether or not you can actually manufacture it. And that's where, I'm trying to dock this here, that's where tolerancing comes into play. Okay, so just like with my optimization wizard, I also have a tolerancing wizard here in sequential mode. So um, sequential systems have a lot of common characteristics, um, and that means that it's easy for us to make a wizard to define your surface tolerances, meaning um, how much a surface could be decentered in X or Y, or how much the whole element, meaning the front and back of the surface, could be decentered in X and Y. Um, so if I were to click OK, you can see it generates a bunch of different tolerances. And then we can calculate the effect of each of these tolerances. We could also work backwards and calculate um, how big uh, these tolerances are allowed to be based on um, um, some system performance metric. Okay, that's an inverse sensitivity analysis. And then um, thirdly, we can also calculate the effect of all these tolerances simultaneously. Okay. 
Now the big difference between the, these capabilities in sequential mode versus in non-sequential mode is that you don't have this nice wizard to generate um, the tolerances for you. Okay? And that's just because non-sequential systems are much more general. Right? I can convert this um, imaging system to non-sequential mode, but I also could define um, you know, uh, an LED or, or a you know, complex um, prism uh, as a CAD object in non-sequential mode. And we just don't have a set of default tolerances that will apply to the vast majority of those systems. So that means you do need to define um, your tolerances manually. However, you still can. So let's see. Where's the tolerance on non-sequential data? Here we go. So all of the parameters that you're using to define your non-sequential system can be toleranced. Right? So any, any of the characteristics um, that you're using to define the shape or size or position of, of your objects in non-sequential mode can be exposed in this editor and then toleranced. And you have um, those same uh, three modes available to you, meaning here, I'll pull up the tolerancing dialog so you can see. Oops. Sorry, I, did, I don't have this well defined. Let me delete all these guys and then I'll open it for you just so you can see what I'm talking about. Here. There are different modes. There's sensitivity, which calculates the impact of each of those tolerances. Um, or there's, there are two different inverse modes which help you calculate what those tolerances should be. And then there's a Monte Carlo um, simulation which, which analyzes the effect of all of the tolerances together. Okay. And all of that is available in non-sequential mode as well. Okay, so I've gone through all of the questions that came in before the demo and we've had a variety of them come in just now. I'm going to give you guys a break from hearing me and hand the floor over to Tom for a bit to, to tackle some of these questions. Uh, so let me just switch presenters. So the first question that came in is how many people use um, objects all over the world? I think I might refer back to Chris on that one on the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> then the uh, the next one that came in is if in sequential mode um, we have a way of measuring the fraction of light hitting a sensor. And um, yes, we can do that. So as as we as Chris mentioned, uh, sequential mode is basically for um, showing you um, the like one light path that goes through a system, so the, the main light path that goes through a system, um, we can calculate how much light makes it from the object plane to the image plane with a with a, 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 a few ways. Um, all of these ways take um, the polarization effects into account, and um, and with this we can account for uh, absorption by material, but also of light going through coatings that can, you can define in your lens to the editor. And the easiest way to make it through, to, to calculate that light go, goes through a system is by simply going into one of our analyses under the polarization tab. And here we've got a transmission. And in this particular setup, we could see that we've got a total transmission on axis of 91%. Yeah, so that would be a very easy way to figure this out. Um, there's also was a quick mention of designing a reflector or reflective system. A reflective system is very easy to define. Um, instead of using a transmissive material, you could simply set one surface as a mirror material. And I'm sorry, this is not going. This is gonna make my system a little bit useless but by setting it to mirror we now have a reflective surface and yeah as you can see it's kind of messing up my system but now we've got a reflective surface okay let me go back on this to make it a little bit pretty again okay so the next question that came in was um if sequential ray trace is limited to um, paraxial rays um, um the answer to that is no um so when when we have, when we trace the rays through the system at each surface, um, the, um, 
the full, like the full Snell's law is calculated for each ray. So this means not only the the linear um, component, but in fact all of the all of the higher order um, terms as well. Um, meaning that when you look at these rays uh, on this layout plot, for example, you see a real ray trace and not just a praxial ray trace. Um, okay. So um, and the next question was, how to best account for manufacturing tolerances? I believe Kristen's already gone through this. Um, if there's any more detailed questions, you can always email us. Next question is if you can design um, Fresnel lenses in sequential ray tracing. Um, so you can, so, um, so there's several ways of going about this. We have in fact a, again, if you go in your lens data editor um, help file, so I need to move the help over. So the help entry for the lens data editor, you can see an overview of all the sequential surfaces um, that are present. And there are in fact two different types of Fresnel um, that are available in your sequential rate, um, in the sequential mode. However, these are idealized Fresnels, meaning that they don't show any grooves as you would have in a realistic um, uh, Fresnel lens. What you could do, um, if you, so this is for an idealized approach. If you wanna, in fact, design um, a, a, a real Fresnel lens that shows the grooves with the pitches and all, um, and, and the full um, surfaces, then I would recommend using the non-sequential mode where you can have, in fact, these as um, real objects. And um, just to build on that and confuse you a little bit more on this, um, you, can, um, you can actually mix the two modes together. So say if you would like to design a predominantly um, sequential um, system, but would like to include a, a more complex object like a, a, um, a general <clears throat> a realistic Fresnel object or any type of CAD object, then you could have in fact this as a component um, within, as a non-sequential component within your sequential system. Yeah, if you would like some more information on this, we recently have, a web, have had a webinar on this and you can find the recordings on our um, website. Okay, let me minimize this one. So the next question was that came in was if we can export the geometry of um, a lens system into um, CAD files like STEP or IGES. And that's in fact a very simple, simple thing to do. Excuse me, you would go into the file tab on top of uh, on, on your ribbon bar and simply here click CAD files you select the range of surfaces that you would like to export. Um, yeah, you go from surface number one to surface number 12 being the image plane. You can define your, um, uh, if you want, if you would like to export the rays as well as just the objects, um, your accuracy. And then finally you can define your file type. So you can in fact export into four different types of cut files and then simply click okay and save the file. And then you can use it to then um, for any like further analysis or use in a different CAD package. The next question that came in was if we can if you can model um, a light pipe in sequential mode. That again, the way to do this is by using the mixed mode. So by again, by importing um, the light pipe. The light pipe a light pipe is a quite is a fairly, is an object that would have multiple um, light bounces from, from different surfaces. So this would be a fairly tricky way to set it up as a sequential system. Because again, every single time a ray bounces off a surface, you would have to then define um, that surface. So if it's like, if there's multiple bounces within the light pipe, you would have to have like multiple surfaces that need to be co-located. Just to avoid this, just and we can import a light pipe in a non, as a non-sequential component within a sequential system. And again, if you would like some more information on this, and we actually show a light pipe, I think in the in the in the webinar example, um, just go um, onto the website and you can watch the um, one of the previous webinars that deals with this. Okay, the next question. Um, 
deals with um, presettings for standard surface finishes. Um, Kristen, I might refer have to refer back to you on this. I'm not quite sure what's meant with that. So we we don't have um, like standard finishes, meaning there's like A1, A2, um, but you can create any combination of finish that you want based on uh, the coding information or the. Uh, the kind of finish, like the, whether it's highly polished or or potentially rough, um, and and so it, it's typically a combination of a coding profile and a scattering profile that you can use, um, and then you can save that combination as your you know surface finish one or surface finish two. Um, actually, I can let me show my screen here. You should be able to see my screen now. Let me go to the the lens data editor here. If you look in the surface properties, we have um, a coding definition here that you can choose. Um, and then in non-sequential mode, um, you can also apply a set of coding and scattering profiles. And actually, I'll just show you, let me just convert this to a non-sequential file. And I'll show you what I mean here. So non-sequential mode has the same user interface as sequential mode. Um, but here you can see, for example, surfaces one and two um, of my first lens now um, have been collapsed into a single object. And here now I'll open up a shaded model analysis as well as a 3D layout so you can see that the lenses are the same, but now I also have, I have three different source objects, which uh, I previously defined as field points. Um, here's the same thing in, in the shaded model view. And now um, I have a detector at my object plane, and then I also have much smaller detectors, um, which pick up the, uh, the smaller spot sizes. Now let's look at one of these objects. Um, instead of surface properties, we have object properties. Now we have a combination of uh, coding and scattering settings. So we have one sample profile defined, uh, which doesn't contain a coding, but which does contain a scatter model. However, you can very easily define your own. Um, we have uh, real codings as well as idealized codings or codings that come from um, our uh, lens vendors. Uh, but you could define an anti-reflective coating and um, some other scattering profile. Let's say it's, here's an example, one that we have. And then uh, you can save these as, say, new profile one, so that I can apply this profile or this combination of coating and, and scattering settings to all of my other objects. We also have knowledge base articles that talk about the different um, surface scattering profiles and that will help you choose um, the right ones for your simulation. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll take a few questions after this too. Um, let's see, so the next question was, uh, are there rendering capabilities in Optic Studio? Um, let's see, I, I think you are referring to probably the, this shaded model. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer this question now, and if I don't answer it in detail enough, uh, please send us a follow-up question, and, and I'll come back to it. Um, but this this shaded model is more of a 3D rendering of what we were looking at before, which was just a, sh uh, a, a layout or kind of a cross-section view. And and this kind of a shaded model is also available in sequential mode. We just I hadn't opened it yet. Um, but in this um, shaded model view, there are a variety of settings you can change, like the opacity of the lenses. So if you want to see how the rays propagate through there, here again, I'll snap it to a YZ plane. There you can see the rays propagating through each of the lenses. You can also change um, the way that the rays are colored. So coloring the rays by segment number means at each ray surface intersection, the color changes. So it makes it very easy to see uh, where those intersections are occurring. Uh, let's see, there are also um, cutting planes that you could turn on. Like, so for example, you could turn on a YZ cutting plane. And let me 
uh, zoom out and rotate this so you can see now I've sliced my system in half and I can use this icon in the middle to adjust um, the orientation of the plane. I can slide it further along in X or Y, and I can also rotate it um, so that really you can look at any arbitrary cross section. Okay. Okay, there's a question about, um, is there a desired number of CPU cores for tolerancing and optimization purposes? Uh, that's a very good question. So actually, let me see if I can open up the knowledge base and I'll pull up the article that talks about this. Sorry, it opened on a different monitor. Um, let's see, I think it's called, um, what kind of a system should I run? Should I get to run Optic Studio? Um, let me see. Let me search specification and see if it comes up. Here, what kind of a computer should I buy to run ZMAX Optic Studio? Um, so here we have um, uh, a series of recommendations for the kinds of computers that you could get. And we also have um, a system requirements page on our website. Let me go to zmax.com. If you go to zmax.com, click on Optic Studio. I believe it's under, yeah, under Optic Studio and System Requirements. These are the minimum requirements. Um, and here we actually link to the knowledge base article that I just opened. But then there also are um, some example systems that were set up, um, and you can see the resulting performance there. Okay, there's a question. Can you please let us know your email addresses for further questions? Uh, yes. So uh, Tom and I have... Uh, fairly busy schedules and so the best way for you to get your question answered is to send it to um, your uh, your uh, sales rep um, I believe for most of you it's it's Ben Carson uh, but we can make sure that we get the right contact information to all of you and then um, whoever receives that will find um, the the most available engineer so it could be Tom it might be myself but we also have um, a global team of uh, optical engineers and so if for example your question comes in late in the day you're more likely to get an answer from one of them okay uh, let's see I'll take uh, one more question and then I'll hand it back to Tom um, so this uh, question is from Oh, let's see. Okay, this question is about um, phosphors and fluorescence. So good thing I'm in non-sequential mode here. Um, if you go to volume physics, we have a phosphors and fluorescence model, uh, which allows you to specify an absorption spectrum, emission spectrum, and then either a quantum yield or excitation spectrum. Uh, so this is a, a very comprehensive um, photoluminescence model um, that will um, essentially predict um, the, the resulting photoluminescence uh, based on uh, these spectra that you enter in here. It also uses a, a me scattering uh, distribution, so you can enter in um, the particle index and particle radius of the uh, photoluminescent particles as well. Um, and, oh, I should also say uh, we have a knowledge base article about this, um, and so I would I would reference our knowledge base for uh, more specific information. Okay, and now I'll hand it over to Tom again. Okay, I'm trying to change to share my screen again. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, right. So the next question was if, well, I think we answered the questions about our email addresses. Um, and then the last or the next question on the list was if, if it's a follow up on the, on the light rendering question. It's about if we could model or render the light output of a light source like a spotlight. So 
let me try to answer this. So we've got several um, types of sources that we can model in Optic Studio. In this particular, this is the setup that Kristen showed you already. It's the, the double ghost in, the, in a non-sequential setup. Um, the source here is defined as an elliptical source, but really it's come from this um, elliptical um, surface. But we have uh, several types of sources. Um, some of them are idealistic, like a point source or a, yeah, in fact, the elliptical source here, or for example, a, a rectangular source or just an individual ray. Um, um, however, we could also um, import uh, or model sources that are um, realistic, so meaning that they are measured. So um, different vendors um, give out source models in different ways. Um, so for example, it could just be uh, an, an angle distribution. And this could be, for example, modeled in a source um, I, IESNA um, or in fact, the EU um, L, LUM um, DAT. So these two file types are purely angular. Um, so for far field distributions, um, the next um, realistic one would be a source file. Several, uh, lots of vendors provide um, source outputs um, via a uh, ray file. This, contain, this can um, contain any number of rays, so be it um, 100,000, a million rays, and so on. And the, the file will be imported, and you would you can trace um, realistic rays through your system. Um, and um, another much more detailed way of modeling would be a called so-called radiant source model. Here, um, you can um, you can see here in our libraries tab um, in in Optic Studio, you can actually see what type of radiant source models are available. Um, we provide a number a number of already uh, um, uh, measured radiant source models in um, on our download server. So, for example. You can see what's already available. So you've got a list of manufacturers, for example, um, Cree or any with any any from Osram to um, yeah, lots of different types of vendors. And then you can go into your vendor, select what type of lamp you would like to have um, modeled, um, and then so say this one here. And actually, they don't have not not available on this one. But see, these are all the available Cree um, lamps. And then you could download the model and use to um, view this, how does the, the, the light looks and model it through your system.